Hey friends, welcome to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. Today, it is all things eggs. So we've talked about eggs here on the podcast before, but since the theme of this season is a deep dive into real food, we're going to ask all the questions that maybe you've been wondering about eggs or things that have been bothering you about your farm fresh eggs, and it's going to be good. So of course, I had to have the queen of all things chicken and all things eggs on with me today, (laughs) Miss Lisa Steele. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Jill. Good to be back. It's been a while. I should say welcome back because we have had you on before. I think last time it was talking um, chicken, just chicken keeping. What did we talk about last time? Herbs, maybe? Did we talk about herbs or gardening? Or I think we talked about gardening and how terrible chickens are in the garden. Yes, we did. We did some complaining. (laughs) Yes, yes, for sure. Um, Well, I'm excited to dive into eggs today for a lot of reasons. The biggest one being we're in, we're getting into egg season here on our homestead, and I'm sure you're probably either there or close to it on yours. Um, and then the other reason is I think yesterday you had your cookbook launch. Was it yesterday? Uh, I don't honestly know what day today is, but it was the 15th. <laughs> yes. Okay. I know, the feeling. I know the feeling. Um, so congratulations on that. It is gorgeous. You guys don't know if you can Thank see you. with the glare. It is the Fresh Eggs Daily Cookbook. It is full color. It is everything you'd ever want an egg cookbook to be. I know you can't see it very well with the light. Um, the, I think the reason I'm most excited about this is because even though I've been homesteading for a long time and I've had chickens forever, I still get to that part of the spring when I have the eggs flowing into the house and I have that moment of like, wait, what do I do with all these? Like I kind of have my um, standby recipes, but I'm always, I either get bored with those or I'm tired of them and I need something else just to use up all the eggs. And this is going to be my new secret weapon. Um, I was already just flipping through it and going, well, I could do this and this and this. So this is super well done. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And same to you. I mean, your cookbook, that crescent roll recipe, I've made your steak. There's so many recipes in it that, you know, get into a regular rotation because they're not just crazy with a bunch of ingredients you never have. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm just into using like a few fresh, really good ingredients. Right. You can just create so much out of so yeah. little, really. Absolutely. And I would say for any of you listening or watching, um, if you like my cookbook, you will like this one because it is in that same vein of simple whole food ingredients. A lot of them, maybe you could grow on your own property. Of course, it featuring eggs, which most of you as homesteaders probably have or have access to. So you will like this one if you like my cookbook for sure. Oh, thanks. Um, all right. So I feel like, you know, a lot of homesteaders are fairly used to eggs, but I kind of wanted to take it to the next level today. So um, you had some great info about eggs in the beginning of your book. And then I was looking at some of the recipes. So I thought of the hardest, I don't know, hardest is the right word, but then most nitty gritty egg questions I could think of. And I'm just going to like throw them at you. Is that okay? Okay, sure. All right. Okay. I, I don't think, I think you'll be fine. I don't think they're too hard. Double jeopardy um, category eggs. Category eggs. All right. First up. Let's, t- let's just go right to the big elephant in the room. Let's talk about salmonella and eggs because I think I, I don't know if I have been spreading bad information. Maybe I just was parroting it. I don't know if it even is bad information, but I would love to hear your, your take on this. Um, you know, we eat eggs raw sometimes, or we eat them not fully cooked. And I don't feel as concerned about it because they're coming from our chickens. And it's kind of always been my belief that if we're, we're eating farm fresh eggs and they're not from the factory farms, I don't have to be quite as concerned about that contamination. Is that true? Or I have, have I just been believing something crazy? Uh, you know, in the whole scheme of things, especially in the world today, salmonella is like way, way down on my list of things I'm concerned about. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously if you're young or old or immune compromised or whatever, yes, you should be taking precautions no matter what kind of eggs you're using. But, you know, with our fresh eggs, most chicken flocks do actually have salmonella. I mean, the hens can live with salmonella. It's not going to hurt them. They pass it into their chicks, to their eggs. But the problem is when there's enough bacteria inside that egg or on that raw chicken that it can affect our health. So if you're eating mostly fresh eggs, the bacteria hasn't had time to really multiply. But an egg that's been sitting around, you know, maybe you washed it and now things can get in through the pores. And once that bacteria gets in there and it starts multiplying and it just, that's when things get messy. I think, I know the stat is in the book. Um, I believe one in 20,000 eggs maybe is thought to contain salmonella, but I would say it's pretty heavily weighted towards like commercial store-bought older eggs. 
you know, I don't know if there's a way to actually test our flax or our eggs. I'm sure there is, you know, it would be kind of interesting to do it sometime just to see if, if it does exist in our eggs. I, you know, I make mayonnaise. In fact, I just make mayonnaise today because I'm sure you do. I make Caesar salad dressing. I made, I made hollandaise sauce. I don't worry about eating raw eggs or partially cooked eggs or anything like that. So it's less than about it just if it's present or not and more about it's probably there, but it hasn't had enough time to proliferate. <laughs> Say that right. Exactly. Um, right. It's on a fresh egg. Okay. And How? if you cook your eggs fully, then you don't have to worry about it. I mean, it's really, okay. we're only talking partially cooked or undercooked eggs. Right. Right. Absolutely. Right. Like the raw cookie dough situation, which I totally eat raw cookie dough. Um, I grew up on raw cookie dough. Like I know. I know. <laughs> and I'm just, I, I let my kids eat it and I just like, yeah. I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. I can't stop. So how long, you probably had this in the book, but I, I may have missed it. How long are we looking at like for those traditional regular old store-bought eggs? How long have they been sitting on the shelf generally? Funny, funny you should ask that because I am doing a bunch of cooking demos this week and next week to promote the book. And I knew I wasn't going to have enough of our eggs. So I actually did go to the store and had to buy store-bought eggs. And I, I bought eight dozen or six dozen, brought them home and looked at them. And they had been in the carton for more than a month already. Oh, okay. So now, you know, they're sitting at the store. Maybe yeah. they're going to sit in the store another week. You buy them, you bring them home. It's another week before you use them. I mean, you could be talking six or eight weeks. And, and that's when it's put in the carton. I, I know that there are are regulations that commercial chicken farms can't let their eggs sit around forever. Like I think they have to be cartoned when a, when a certain period of time of being laid, but it's not minutes you know, you're probably talking another day or two. So when you add that all up, you could be looking at like two months. And that's why they behave so drastically different than what you're going to get from your backyard flock. Exactly. Yeah. What is They're your bad, bad behaviors? Yes. In the old days. Yes. Yes. <laughs> totally different. Um, for mm -hmm. sure. What's your, what's your favorite way to determine like freshness with your homegrown eggs? Like sometimes when the kids bring them in, like they'll mix, drives me crazy, but they mix the old ones with the new ones. And I'm like, which is which? How do you determine that? I know. I used to, when I first started out, I used to mark with a pencil the day I collected them and put them in order and use them in order. Now they just get tossed in the, in the crisper yeah. bin in our fridge. Um, you know, the float test, which I'm sure most home setters are, are familiar with, is you just put the egg in a, a glass of water and if it sits on the bottom, it's fresh. And if it starts to float, it's older or whatever. But the problem with that is, is you're washing the bloom off of that egg. So now if you're not going to use it, it's gotten wet and it has to be refrigerated. So a better way, if you just hold the egg up to your ear and you shake it, if you can feel things moving around, the egg is old because air has gotten in, moisture has gotten out. If you shake the egg and it's like, it's not moving, it's pretty fresh. Okay. That's, that's a good time. And I like that way better because you're not getting the egg wet. For sure. And I've had some interesting results from the float test. Like I felt like Sometimes they've floated or sunk and it ha I've cracked them open expecting, you know, it to be rotten or whatever and it Definitely. hasn't or the vice versa. So I don't know. I'm a little bit not trusting of that method, although maybe it works. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. No, I, you know, and actually, because it, 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 it does tell you how old the egg is, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that it's bad. Like an egg that floats isn't necessarily bad and full of bacteria. Mm -hmm. It's just so old that enough air has gotten in that it's now buoyant. And similarly, you know, you know, when you hatch eggs, sometimes yeah. some of them will get that blood ring and they go bad. I guess if an egg has bacteria in it, like maybe it has a little crack or something in it, it could sink to the bottom, but still be full of bacteria because it's not old, but it's just bad. Sure. I guess. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So you have to have a little uh, discretion there, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, can you explain the bloom in case someone's listening and they're not sure what that is? Yes. I mean, I actually find the whole egg laying process just phenomenal that a the hen does it every day, but after she puts the shell around the white and adds the pigment and does her whole deal and the egg is ready to come out, the last thing she does is apply an invisible coating over that egg and it's called the bloom or the cuticle. And what that does is it seals the pores because eggshells are very porous and that seals the pores. So air and bacteria doesn't get into the egg and also the egg doesn't lose moisture. So as the egg ages, that bloom breaks down and the purpose of it is not for us to keep our eggs fresh. It's because if there's a baby chicken side, it needs to regulate how much air is getting in because that baby is going to need an air sac to breathe. 
you know, before it hatches and like, it's all very scientific, but for our purposes, it helps to keep the egg fresher longer. Okay. Yes. And that's why if you're going to put your eggs on the counter, you don't want to wash them because then you're removing that bloom and then that's where you're going to go bad more quickly. Is that right? right? And that's the, yeah, that's the first line of defense um, for an egg to stay fresh, obviously then the shell and then the inner membrane, but that bloom is like the most important, like it definitely serves a purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So I think I may have talked about this on the podcast, but it has been a long time ago. Uh, so I, I know that there's always people ask me this question. It's a really big problem. It's the question of peeling your hard boiled fresh eggs. What's your favorite method to get that done? I think we have the same favorite method. Somebody told me years ago that her grandmother had let her in on the secret. Instead of boiling them, I just get some water to a simmer and then I put a colander or a bamboo steamer or a double boiler or something on top of it and then put the eggs in 12 minutes and then right into ice water and they peel perfectly. And an added benefit is that sometimes when you're hard boiling eggs, they bounce around and they'll break. So if you're steaming them, they're just sitting nicely in that basket. They're not moving, they're not breaking, they're not cracking into each other. So that's, I haven't actually boiled eggs in years and years and years. Yeah, it's magic. Sometimes I'll use my Instant Pot too. Um, I think for only four minutes or I can't remember, three minutes, but it works. Yeah, it's the same principle, it's still steam. Right, exactly. And that's, it's some, you know, magic science thing that the, the steam and then the ice water. Cause if you skip yeah. the ice water, they're not gonna peel. You have to do both. Yeah, it is magic though, guys. If you haven't tried it, like you've got to try it. Because otherwise there's a lot of bad words that happen when I peel eggs because they're horrible. <laughs> really there horrible. are. And every time I ask that question or post on social media and then people are like, salt the water, put in baking soda, prick a hole in the egg. I'm like, or just steam them because yeah. it works. <laughs> and it's easy. Yeah. I have tried back in the day, I tried the pricking whole thing and it was a disaster. Like, I don't, I'm like, I don't know how y'all are doing this. You might have better finesse than me, but it did not work at all. Mm -mm. I don't, no. Yeah. So, okay. Um, this is a baking question. Okay. I, you know, I, for anyone who has my cookbook may know, I, I like like non-fussy things. I, I cut corners liberally. So whenever a recipe says start with room temperature eggs, um, well, a lot of times I have eggs on my counter, so that's easy. But if I don't have eggs on my counter, I'm like, nah, I don't need room temperature eggs. And I just plow through that and ignore it. So how, how bad is that? <laughs> It is kind of bad. You know, when a recipe says, well, when a recipe says room temperature, anything, whether it's butter, cream cheese, milk, you know, there's a reason because if you're making a batter or a dough and you throw cold ingredients in, the fats in that dough are going to seize up. Oh, okay. So it is sort of important, but I mean, it's not yeah. the end of the world, you know, and like you said, normally we have a bowl of eggs on the counter, so you can use them. And they're going to be room to, I mean, our house is, is so cold in the winter because we have a wood stove. So we don't, you know, keep the house itself warm. So I put things out on the counter to warm up and they really never come to room temperature. But I mean, as long as it's not cold, cold, cold out of the fridge. Okay. That makes sense. I, I guess I didn't know it was about the fats, which makes sense because like, obviously cold butter is very different in a recipe than room temperature butter. So it'd be kind of similar to that dynamic. It's kind of very similar. Yeah, exactly. And same if, if your recipe calls for cold milk and cold butter, that does not mean the butter that you have at room temperature. It means cold butter. Like baking yeah. is such a science that amounts matter, measurements matter, temperatures yeah. matter, that all matters. Okay. Well, I will, I'm going to do better on my room temperature. Egg. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to follow that instruction. Once something, once I understand why, then I do better. Otherwise, if I don't understand why, I'm like, eh. It's not important, which isn't always. No, I agree with you. Well. Doesn't turn out well. Right. Um, all right. So talk to me about scrambling eggs. I noticed an interesting little inset in your book that mentioned adding salt. You know, whether you know before you scramble or when you're mixing the eggs or afterwards. What's the difference there? Again, like very. I feel like ed, eggs bring out like the science nerd in you or yeah. me, whatever. Um, so I think, you know, when you salt something, like if you're making a cucumber salad, you're going to put your cucumbers in a colander, salt them, and it's going to draw all the moisture out. So same with the eggs. If you salt the eggs, you know, before they're cooking or while they're cooking, it's going to draw moisture out of them and they're going to get watery. So you really want to salt your scrambled eggs after they're done cooking. The only thing is if you like kind of really soft eggs, if you salt them, like as you're whisking them, if you add some salt, that breaks down the protein bonds in the egg and it'll make like softer, creamier eggs. So if that's what you're going for, that's fine. But you really don't want to salt them until 
they're done. Okay. That's good to know because I, I, I hardly ever salt at the table. So I might need to, to change that. Um, okay. And honestly, fresh eggs are so good sometimes, like I'll just scramble up in butter and not even add salt ever because they're just so delicious and you have a little bit of the salt and the butter. What is your favorite fat for scrambled eggs? Is it butter? Or is that what you use most often? Well, I take that back. I think heavy cream might be my favorite fat oh. to, uh, oh, yeah. well, not for scrambled eggs, for fried eggs. I don't add, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people say add milk or water or cream to your scrambled eggs, but I think it just makes them watery. And I think if you have nice fresh eggs, there's no need to add, you know, any additional liquid, but for like fried eggs, heavy cream is definitely my preferred fat. I mean, heavy cream for everything is okay with me. All the heavy cream. <laughs> well, um, right. Cause you have cows. I have a guess it's cows. <laughs> sometimes, well, sometimes, as long as we have it, sometimes it's, they hold it back, but that's, that's a topic for another day. Um, right. All right. So what about preserving? And you had a couple of methods that you mentioned in your book. Um, what's your favorite method for, for preserving eggs? Like, you know, you get done with a spring excess and then you're trying to tuck them away for later in the year. Well, I mean, honestly, if you just before molting season and the days get shorter, if you start kind of like stockpiling them and you don't wash them and you put them in the fridge, they probably will take you right through to spring when they start laying again. I'm still working on eggs that we collected in September and October. I've only found two, I think that are bad. And my chickens are starting to, to lay again. So I've never really gotten heavy duty like into the water glassing or lime or any of those. I, I never saw the need to preserve mm -hmm. eggs for like two years, <laughs> you know, because like every spring you're getting new eggs. But I do like to freeze them. I, I've been caught short at the holidays. So if you whisk your eggs up, add a teeny bit of salt, put them in um, ice cube trays, freeze them, pop them out. Each cube is kind of equivalent to an egg. And then you can just you know, measure out how many you need to frost and use them for baking. You could also scramble or make a quiche or frittata or something. So I think that's my favorite way just because it's super simple and easy. Okay. Are, is the texture of them once they thaw out, would that be something you would want to eat like scrambled or is it just better for baking? It's a little different. It's, it's really just better for baking. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, salt cured eggs. I have never done those. Will you kind of explain that process for everybody listening? Yeah, that is, is completely different because it is a way of preserving eggs. You know, like if you're just going to throw them away or waste them, you might want to do this, but it doesn't preserve them for baking or really eating. So, I mean, I, I've done it a couple of times. I did it for my blog and I did it for the book. Um, the process is you take your egg yolks and you put them into a bed of basically salt with a little sugar and you salt cure them. And then they dry out and they turn into this weird texture. And then you can grate them like over pasta or something, almost like they're cheese. Mm. I have to say they do kind of taste like cheese, but I think probably just because they're really salty. Yeah. But I'd rather just use real cheese. So that whole thing, I mean, I included it because it's kind of interesting and it might appeal to some people. But sure. for me, I really couldn't see the purpose of it. Because if I'm going to save an egg, I want to save that egg so I can bake with it or right you don't eat it somehow because it's pretty unique like I mean that's a kind of a one-trick pony almost right exactly and I mean honestly I love cheese so why would I right. why would I ever want to secure egg yolk and salt to yeah. pretend it's cheese sure um it is interesting though I mean I guess maybe if someone's dairy free it's worth it if it's worth a look if you're watching or listening and um you're looking for that I mean you couldn't make macaroni and cheese out of it <laughs> but something to give a little bit of an accent maybe on top of your dishes might be right a good, exactly good um, kind of back over to the, the chicken side of things. What are your favorite laying breeds If someone's listening and they're going to add chickens this year? And wh where would you start? What are your favorites? I really like Australorps. They're, um, they're hardy, whether it's cold hardy or heat tolerant, they're really calm and gentle. They make good moms. You know, I've had a couple go broody over the years, but they're not like super, super broody, great layers nice big brown eggs. I think if you could only raise one breed of chicken, I would probably choose that one. And if you are the type of person that also is gonna eat your chickens, they're a good dual purpose. Cause I mean, those girls have some meat on their bones. Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. my chubby girls. Yeah. I like, I like that. Now do you, you don't eat yours, do you? Or do you? I didn't think no. so. Okay. I think we talked mm -hmm. about that last time. Yeah. Which yeah. I totally understand. Yeah. 
Um, Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of chicken. Like I feel like you have to do so much to a chicken breast to make it taste good that I would rather eat a good steak or a a piece of lamb or even duck. I mean, we don't eat our ducks Mm. either, but you know, chicken really never was a favorite. I, I think it's kind of bland, honestly. It really is, especially breasts, which is strange how they become like the the only type of chicken, or not the only, but one of the most popular ways we as Americans eat chicken, because it is very, it is very bland, very dry. Yeah, chicken thigh. I mean, I'll make like, I love mm-hmm. making like Indian butter chicken. I do make that. And then I use the thighs because they are, yeah. you know, and, and then I just make sure it looks nothing like a chicken. And I'm just yeah. in complete denial that I'm eating yeah. chicken. I think that's fair. I think we'll give you, I think it totally give you a pass for that considering um, what you built your entire platform on is love of chicken. Totally fine. Totally fine. Um, So let's say you have a glut of eggs. What's your favorite savory dish to make with them? Like if you needed a quick supper. Oh, see, and that's the thing. And that was the thing writing my book. I did not want to break it into chapters. Like I told my editor, I wanted mm. two chapters, savory and sweet. And he said, well, you can't just have two chapters in a cookbook. You have to break it down. And I said, but I don't want to, I don't want to put omelets in that breakfast mm. or brunch category because I think an omelet for dinner is great. Like, like we'll have sometimes bacon, eggs and toast for dinner. So I didn't like that idea, but, but I, obviously I lost that battle because yeah. we do have chapters in the book, but I mean, I feel like you could pick almost anything from any chapter and eat it any time of the day. Um, honestly though, and this is going to be kind of a weird answer, homemade Caesar salad with homemade dressing and homemade crouton mm. in the summer. Like I could eat a whole bowl of that. Yeah. So good. Really good. That does sound really good. That's like Caesar's salad to a whole new level. Like when you're doing mm-hmm. your own dressing, your own croutons. Yes, garlic, yeah. tons of garlic. And mm. yes, really, that's one of my favorite recipes in the summer just to, to make that so yes. good. That sounds amazing. Uh, okay, so what about your favorite sweet recipe? Definitely creme brulee. Mm, okay. I'm just yeah. such a traditionalist. And uh, yeah. I will order that out because I, I do love it. <laughs> um, and I like to try, you know, other you know, restaurant chefs, creme brulee, but I get so annoyed when it comes and there's like a cookie stuck in it or there's fruit and whipped cream on it because like, I don't want anything on my creme brulee. Like the whole idea of it is just that crack. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you putting the cookie in my creme brulee for? Yeah, Don't crack it ahead of time. Yes. <laughs> don't put raspberries on it. Don't want raspberries on it. Just bring it out like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's got like what, three or four ingredients. It's like one of the most pure recipes, I think. It's just and it's, delicious. It's- it's one of those, I love the, they're kind of gourmet or they're kind of fancy, but it's like, this is a homesteader's recipe, man. Like this was, this is with basic good farm ingredients. And mm-hmm. if you have your good ingredients, you can take this, you know, fancy restaurant thing and it's, you're serving it at your table on a weeknight because it's, it's that uh, well suited to the homestead life with, with what you can grow. Yeah. I love mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, we do that with our steak sometimes. Like the kids think steak is like a Wednesday night we think meal just because we grow it ourselves so it's just a different dynamic which is right the filet mignon sure kids yeah, we can have like, that every night. I didn't even have filet mignon until I was like 25 but they have it you know the eight-year-old has it so I'm like you guys don't know how good you have it with this homestead thing I mean it's a lot of work but you get the little payoffs there right. so mm-hmm. um what any other last bits of advice to someone who is dealing with a lot of eggs this spring or they have their first set of chickens or gearing up for the egg production anything you want to share with them I think advice that I got from a homesteader years ago was that he treats eggs, and I think we've talked about this before, but he treats eggs as a seasonal ingredient, just like a tomato or a cucumber or a squash. And when you have a lot, you eat a lot. And when you don't have a lot, you eat other things. And I think that that's really good advice. And that was part of the reason for doing this book is to let people know if you eat eggs every meal today, that's okay. Because two months from now, you might not have any eggs and you won't be eating them. So I really just want people to incorporate eggs in different ways into their diet other than just like frying an egg for breakfast. Yes. They're, they're and really, get yeah. and, yes, <laughs> my other piece get of chickens. yes, get the chickens. Absolutely. Um, yeah. The seasonality, I didn't know they were seasonal until I started homesteading. I had no idea. Same with milk, you know, milk can be seasonal. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I like how homesteading forces us to get creative when we have those feasts of ingredients and then we can pull back and let ourselves recharge from them during the dry months, whether it's vegetables or beef or, or milk or eggs. So I think that right. seasonality is really important. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So I, can you remind everybody where to follow you online? And I will say guys, go grab this book. It's, it's amazing. It's a beautiful gift. It's, it's very well done. Um, Lisa outdid herself and the recipes are stuff you're actually going to make. Cause I know like a lot of times I get cookbooks at the library and I return them and I never buy them. This is one you will use time and time again. So I'm um, sorry. I interrupted you, <laughs> um, no, after I asked you to share, but where can people <laughs> follow along with your adventures? Super easy. Freshegdaily.com, Fresh Egg Daily on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever. And um, yeah, my book is, you know, wherever books are sold, check your local library or local bookstore online, wherever, and make sure to buy Jill's at the same time. Very sweet of you. Um, I think they're very good companion books. They are. They really are. I mean, I don't, I don't know that I have any, I think there's bacon in a couple of recipes, but I don't think that there's any other meat in any of the recipes, you know, so even if you're like vegetarian or trying to cut yeah. back on, on meat or whatever, and then get all the meat recipes in gel, steak. Yes, steak. <laughs> but eggs are, eggs are a protein source. I mean, we have a lot of beef, but we still use them as a primary protein in a lot of meals just because they're cheap right. and they're easy and... Yeah, they're a great fallback. They're, they're the original convenience food, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Lisa, I know you have a very full week with all of your book launch activities. So I don't want to keep you too long, but thank you so, so much for coming on and sharing all your egg wisdom with us today. Always a pleasure, Jill. I will come back anytime and talk about pretty much whatever you want. Awesome. <laughs> we'll do it. Thanks, Jill.